Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Matt Clark, and I am a neuropathology trainee based um, down in London. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our PathQuest event, which, where you get the opportunity to explore what careers in neuropathology and paediatric pathology um, uh, can offer you. Um, so thank you so much for taking your time out this evening uh, to join us. Um, it's great to have so many people who are interested in exploring these careers in pathology. Um, the event tonight will consist of um, a few exciting things. We've got some talks from current trainees um, who will tell you about what the careers in um, both neuropathology and paediatric pathology can offer you. And um, we'll also have some case presentations as well to showcase what the job actually involves. And then we're also going to have a live Q&A session, um, again, mixture of consultants and current trainees from around the country where it's your opportunity really to ask us anything you like about the specialty whether that's about the job itself or about applications about interviews etc um the floor is yours to ask us so make sure you make the most of the q a um, function at the bottom of your, of your zoom screens and you can ask us anything you like about it and we'll do our best to uh, to provide the answers for you but first of all, what I'd like to find out is um, just to get an idea about the background of who we've got joining us. We'd like to find out if you're actually here because you're interested in neuropathology or whether you're interested in paediatric pathology. And my colleague Carla is now going to give us a little poll. And I'll just ask you to take a few minutes just to select which one of these that you're particularly interested in. Or you might be interested in both, in which case we've got a challenge to try and um, persuade you uh, to one or the other. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to uh, to vote for which one you're interested in. Okay, Carla, if we can close the poll, let's have a look and see what our our audience is reflected. Let's see. Oh, so a fairly even split. So quite a few people actually wanting to um to see uh, to interested in both specialties. So that's pretty good. And um slightly more perhaps uh, interested in neuropathology. But it's great to have you all here this evening, and hopefully you'll find this event useful. So what I'm going to do first of all, though, is um, I'm just going to share my screen with a quick slide to go through um, about why should I actually subspecialize? And well, I think one of the, both of these specialties are quite small specialties. So we're quite a small niche area um, across the UK and internationally as well. But that's not a bad thing. This is a great opportunity for you to actually become an expert in your field. Um, and that's not just in, in this country, that can be internationally as well. And many of the colleagues that we work with and train with are recognized internationally, regularly, regular speakers around the world in their chosen topic or research interest as well. And so there's great opportunities um, for you in terms of your career progression. Another thing is that being a small specialty as well is that we have great training opportunities. Um, so there are, again, when you're based within a, in a specialist department, um, there's no sort of competition for opportunities. You can get stuck into all elements of the job. And also it allows you to really network and go and explore a different aspects of the job um, in different departments around the country as well. So maybe if the training opportunities in a particular area are not quite so um, a available within the department you are, you can arrange placements either in this country or even internationally to go and get further experience as well. So there's a lot of flexibility and opportunity that way as well. The other good thing about it is job prospects. So these are two specialties actually that we're the workforce numbers need to increase and um, to cope with the current workload that both specialties are facing at the moment so you're almost guaranteed a job at the end of this which is fantastic and again there's flexibility in terms of where that might may, where the, where you might want to work as well and it's a very um they're both specialties are very welcoming actually and open to having conversations to explore and make sure that you're you end up in the place that you want to be and working as a as a specialty doctor or as a, or as a consultant I also think they're great specialties to be a part of because they're really fast advancing and really showcasing a lot of the cutting, cutting edge technology and opportunities that pathology has to offer. So, for example, molecular pathology has been a massive revolutionary aspect of both specialties over the years. Um, and it's these two specialties that are actually leading the way um, with a lot of the advances related to this. And we're seeing the same thing associated with digital pathology, where we're now seeing transitioning from using slides and microscopes to now using the digital screens to actually analysing our cases. And alongside that, we've also got the exciting opportunities that artificial intelligence are going to bring with us as well. So if you want a to be involved in a specialty that's very cutting edge and fast paced, this is, these two are definitely ones to consider as well. And the other thing about being part of quite small specialties is that you really get to know everyone. And I, this is something I really like about them. We have specialty meetings very regularly. So for example, for neuropathology, we have the British Neuropathological Society meeting each year. 
where we get to welcome our co co trainee colleagues from around the country, but also internationally as well. And you get to know each other very well, get to know what everybody's working on or perhaps their research interests, if you're particularly interested in that aspect of it. And so there's a real opportunity for collaboration, getting to know people, um, arranging placements with that. And I think that's a nice advertisement for both of these specialties. Heather, my colleague Heather is a consultant paediatric pathologist. Heather, do you have anything anything from um, the paediatric side specifically that you want to add to why you should subspecialise? No, I mean, as you've kind of alluded to, I think there are quite a few parallels between both paediatric pathology and neuropathology, which is, I think, what, why this exciting webinar works so well, because they both have um, such exciting prospects and um, I, I'm, I basic, are going to help... Um, are going to uh, like allow people to really explore um, up and coming advances in the specialty and are just really exciting areas of pathology to get into with and um, with a much needed um, workforce requirement in, in both fronts. So from my side, I, I just want to echo much of what Dr. Clark said and, and thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Thank you for your interest and hopefully between us all, we can um, inspire some of you to uh, Join us on in our our relative fields and and the exciting future that they both hold. So, I will hand back over to uh, Dr. Clark to discuss what a, a career in neuropathology can offer you. And um, yeah, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Heather. Uh, yes, so now I'm going to give you a little bit, a 20 minute talk um, about what a career in neuropathology can offer. So, as I mentioned, I'm a neuropathology trainee, but I'm also an um, clinical lecturer, which means my training is actually split 50-50. So it's 50% of my time is spent um, doing research and 50% is spent doing clinical training. But before I begin, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how I actually got involved in neuropathology, um, because it didn't actually, it came about kind of by accident, really. Um, I was a histopathology registrar um, at ST3 level, halfway through my training, um, based down in Brighton. And an opportunity came to spend six months at the Institute of Cancer Research uh, learning about molecular pathology. Um, and of course, that being the big um, advance that was happening in our specialty, I thought it would be very good to get some basic knowledge and learn, learn about this and how it was relevant to pathology practice going forward. And so I applied for the post and I got it and I was allocated to a research team that studied brain tumours at the Institute of Cancer Research. And within two months of being in that placement, I was absolutely loving it. And I was in my supervisor's office asking if there was an opportunity to do a PhD with the team. And so we looked and found an opportunity. I applied for it and got the post. Um, and so I spent four years with the team doing brain tumour focused research. And so that's where my interest and my love of neuropathology actually came from, because by the end of it, um, I, that's where I wanted to actually go back into. And so I ended up, um, instead of going back into the histopathology side, I ended up applying for a neuropathology place. And here I am now, um, three years down the line and um, just coming towards the end of, towards the latter stages of my training now. So again, it might be interesting for you to ask some of, some of the other people on the call a bit later on about how they came to be interested in their particular specialty as well. So what can a career in neuropathology offer you? Well, of course, one of the big aspects of this and probably the bulk of the work that we do is related to diagnostics. And for those of you who may already be working in histopathology or one of the other or interest, got a particular interest in this, I think this image of working as a medical detective is probably one of the things that actually attracts you or it certainly attracted me to working in the specialty. I love, not know, I love being able to bring all the jigsaw pieces together and try and work out why someone is unwell. And that's the same principle that you have um, with neuropathology as you would with the general all the other specialties as well and it's very relevant to pediatric pathology so this is a this is something that really excites me and really I find really interesting and you never quite know what you're going to see down the microscope or what's on the digital screen and I think the training is is very exciting because you're never going to know the answer to absolutely everything that you come across and you'll find a bit like me here with all my books around me that we are always we needing to look up things we needing to look at research papers and try and work out what's wrong with something but the training is to actually educate you in, and train you into how to approach a case that maybe the answer to it is not quite apparent when you first look at it 
Um, the other thing I like about the specialty of neuropathology is the teamwork. So you're part of a very close knit team, whether that's your trainee colleagues, the consultants, but also the lab team, the biomedical scientists that you work with, clinical researchers, increasingly now research scientists and also bioinformaticians who deal with big data to do with the molecular pathology side as well. So there's a huge range of different people that you're a part of the team but also your instrumental element of the multidisciplinary team as well, where you'll be working very closely with neurologists and neurosurgeons and a very active part of the multidisciplinary team each, each day. And it's not unusual for our phone to constantly or frequently be going with this, our clinical team colleagues um, asking us questions about different approaches in terms of the diagnostics of particular cases and asking us advice. So you very much, although you may not necessarily be seeing patients face to face as much, you're definitely part of the clinical team and helping to advise them and the next steps going forward. And of course, the main crux of what we do is our microscopic work. So looking down the microscope at specimens, whether that's brain, um, spinal cord, muscle, nerve, or even autopsy specimens, and looking at those features of them, looking at the cytology of them, looking at the pattern and the architecture of those cells in their relationship to each other, and using special stains to try and work out what those cells might be and where they've actually developed from is a key element to it. And I, again, that's a really exciting part of the job. And there's a huge spectrum of different diseases that can affect the central and peripheral nervous system as well as the neuromuscular systems that you get to become aware of. And as I mentioned, we're now seeing such fast advances in terms of this specialty that the many, there are many different jigsaw pieces that you're bringing together here. So it's not just what the, what the microscopic appearance might be, but it's also the different molecular tests. So looking at the sequencing results, other molecular tests such as fluorescence in situ hybridization, you might be looking at CSF samples as well, and even electron microscopy. So there are lots of different dimensions to this job. Um, but ultimately, what you're trying to do is provide an accurate diagnosis to help ensure optimal patient outcome. Um, and that's irrespective of what specialty you end up going into. Now, as I mentioned, molecular neuropathology has really um, advanced significantly in terms of our specialty. And most of the tumor work that we do will involve this, but also now huge elements of the neurodegeneration work and neuromuscular work is related to neuro uh, molecular neuropathology. And so now, instead of just looking at what a cell looks like down the microscope, we can now go inside the cell and look at the genetic information, look at the proteins, et cetera, as well, and try and work out what has actually caused that disease. And importantly, as well, try and find out what we can actually do to try and treat it. And so there's a big research element associated with that. And in neuropathology, we have lots of different molecular tests available to us. So DNA methylation profiling is a massive one that we use in terms of brain tumors um, to help, to help us um, confirm our diagnosis. But we also have different sequencing modalities. We can use immunohistochemistry to try and um, identify uh, what different cell type. Uh, we can get a lot of information about the molecular characteristics of tumors and other tissues based on immunohistochemistry staining and we also have the fluorescence in situ hybridization as well so and each each every few years there's a new technique that we might may be using um, and currently one of the big ones that we're facing or in, in, in the process of trying to implement is nanopore sequencing which instead of allowing us to have to wait perhaps two three weeks for a result this will provide us with a result of different sequence the sequencing results within a few hours so things are fast paced and fast moving in the right direction and it's also an opportunity if you're interested in research to really get stuck in and get involved in in this because there are so many questions still unanswered about how we understand um, the different diseases of the nervous system as well. Digital pathology is also fast advancing within neuropathology. So we're now moving from using the slides to now using the digital screen to help with our, our assessment of different slides. And so in the department that we work in, in uh, myself and Tom working in London and Fernanda, we, um, for all our specimens that we look at with from peripheral nerve biopsies and muscle are all looked at digitally. So again, it's, we're, move, we're moving fast towards a situation where all the biopsies will be looked at in this way as well. Well, and that's the same in other, other departments around the country, and I'm sure across the board for paediatric pathology as well. And alongside that, we're finding advances in artificial intelligence. And you'll hear a lot of discussion about that in the press at the moment, about the good and bad side of that. And there's a, the same is being talked about in terms of pathology and the concerns about whether this is actually going to take over our jobs in the future. But I can assure you this is not the case. Um, it's another tool that we can have in our toolkit to actually help us um, in our diagnostic process. 
process. And I, I, for when you talk to the computer scientists who are involved in working in artificial intelligence, they don't have much of an idea about pathology at all. And they're wanting us to be able to tell them about what they can do to actually help. So I think pathologists are going to be very much the guiding hand in trying to work out uh, what the best use of artificial intelligence will be for the future. So it's going to be here to help. It's going to hit, come and help us in what we do on a daily basis. And alongside this digital engagement that we're seeing, we also have the uh, training is uh, moving along in these lines as well. And so we've now seen the advancement of the pathology portal, which has been organised by the Royal College of Pathologists um, associated with NHS England. And it's now a digital learning environment where there are over 5,000 cases, I think there are now on there. Um, and there is a section for neuro neuropathology as well. So if you're interested in exploring a little bit more about the cases that you might come across in the specialty, you can visit the college website and actually see some of the cases um, via the portal as well. Um, and to illustrate some of the different tumor types that we may see um, and the different molecular tests that we can do also. So I think engagement with digital pathology and AI provides huge learning opportunities um, as well as advancing our specialty in terms of the diagnostics and research as well. So what about teaching and research? Well, again, if you enjoy teaching, neuropathology is definitely a specialty for you to consider in pathology. There are fantastic and abundant teaching opportunities for you to get involved with, whether that's people, the general public, whether that's going to schools, but also junior colleagues, medical students, um, even existing trainees who may be junior to you in terms of the training rotations. There are huge opportunities to get involved in teaching across the board. And so I'd strongly advise you to get involved in that and encourage you as well, because I think it certainly helps to expand your knowledge um, as you go through your training to do that. There's also huge opportunities to get involved in research as well. And as I mentioned, I came into this specialty because of my interest in, in brain tumor research. And just to give you an example of what you can do and how you can make a difference, my PhD was focused on looking at tumors that occurred in children under the age of four. And through the work within the team, we were able to identify a new type of tumor that specifically occurs in children who are aged less than one, so very young children and predicted to be a very high grade and aggressive tumor with a bad prognosis. But through our molecular testing, we were able to identify that it only has a single change in the DNA, which is actually targetable with a particular drug that's available on the market now. And so now these children are actually doing well and are surviving. And it now features within the new WHO classification of central nervous system tumors as well. And there are many other such cases of research opportunities that you can get involved with if that's something you're particularly interested in. Um, neuropathology is certainly a very academic specialty and even if you don't want to do any research yourself and that's absolutely fine just having an appreciation of the different research elements that are going on is important um, and keeping up to date as best you can to make sure that you're not missing out and allowing your your diagnostic practice to continue moving forward in the right direction so there are opportunities to be involved with continuous advancement of the specialty as well but what about the subspecialties within neuropathology itself so I've mentioned a bit about brain tumors so far, but there are lots of other different elements as well. So one of the big ones is also neurodegeneration, which is a huge problem that we're seeing facing or well, facing the elderly population across um, the international community. And so I think um, this is a this is a big element of the practice of a neuropathologist. And we also work very closely allied with um, brain banks because we're very fortunate that patients will frequently decide to donate their brain to research after they've passed away. And it gives the neuropathologist the opportunity to actually confirm the diagnosis of the, of the neurodegenerative disease, but also um, a fantastic opportunity to do some research related to that as well. So that might be related to different forms of dementia, but also movement disorders as well. So there is a big opportunity and big um, associated workload in that area of um, neuropathology that you can get involved with and we certainly as trainees um, get involved with that a lot also. I've mentioned about the brain tumor or particularly brain tumor work um, but there's also tumors that can occur in other locations of course within the spinal cord as well um, so this is um, this is a, a, a quite a significant element to it. We also involved, of course, with muscle biopsies and peripheral nerve biopsies. Um, again, a variety of different diseases that can affect both of those locations and quite complex conditions as well. And the neuropathologist plays a vital role in helping to guide the clinicians to the right diagnostic, um, diagnostic outcome for the patient. 
And another, another element just to mention is autopsies. So within our training, we perform general autopsies as well as neuropathology specific ones. And the auto general autopsy is actually a component of our examination at the end of training. And so if you want to, you can actually choose to carry on doing general autopsies after the completion of training. And that's another element, particularly if you're still interested in the other side of the general pathology side, an element where you can still be involved in that aspect. But also a lot of people I know have gone into pathology because they're actually interested in the forensics side as well. And actually, normally, if you're a histopathology trainee, you have to apply to, to go to enter a specific forensic pathology training program in order to be able to practice forensic pathology. But in neuropathology, we can actually, and the same way with the pediatric pathology, if you would like to do some forensic work, there are opportunities to do that within, within um, the specialty as well. So that's definitely something to think about if you're particularly interested in it. So how can I actually get some exposure to neuropathology going forward? So it's actually, if you're a histopathology trainee, it's a requirement of the curriculum that you actually get exposure to this. Um, and normally people spend about two weeks um, within, a, within a department. Um, but I, I would certainly advise thinking about whether to extend that to, to a longer period of time if you've got the flexibility to that, because two weeks isn't actually that longer time. And it, it give, having a longer period will really allow you to immerse yourself in the different aspects of the specialty and properly get some exposure and experience related to that that could make a difference to your, your, your career choices. The other thing to mention is that try and get it sorted out as early as you can within your training program. Um, and the reason for that is that we, again, frequently see people in histopathology that are perhaps further down their training program coming towards the end of it. And they often say that they, if they'd done it a bit earlier, this would definitely be something they would have thought about doing. So give yourself the opportunity to think about it as a career option by doing it a bit earlier in, in your training pathway if you can. Um, and so make the opportunities to make the arrangements for your placement now as quickly as you can by speaking to your supervisors and also speaking to existing trainees about how they went about doing it as well. So what about applications and training um, in relation to neuropathology? Well, there are normally two recruitment rounds each year, uh, one in the autumn and one in the spring. And there are actually 20 places um, available. Um, seven are currently vacant with two trainees who are actually due to complete their training very shortly. Um, so we're going to be very shortly having nine opportunities um, again for training posts. So it, just to give you an idea that uh, there are plenty of opportunities to get a training post if you're particularly interested in it. You usually, everybody has to complete two years of histopathology training first. And the reason for that is that it gives you the basics of um, how to actually approach um, microscopic examination of um, a specimen, but also it gives you training in terms of autopsy techniques as well. So it's very valuable to give you a stepping stone up when you, when you move into neuropathology training. And so it's normally you apply in your ST2 year. So you start then in your ST as an ST3 and then run through training through to ST6. Um, and if you pass the final part of your exam, you can complete your training after that. And there are plenty of consultant posts available. And one of the things that I like about this specialty is again about the, the fantastic networking and communication we have uh, with our cons consultant colleagues around the country. We're regularly in touch with them through meetings, um, et cetera, as well, and teaching opportunities. And so if there's a particular center that you're interested in perhaps working in, they're very open to having conversations about that at an early stage as well. So there's a, a, a lot of opportunities to find the post that's suitable for you in the future. We are also lucky to have the support of the British Neuropathological Society, um, which is the overarching society um, that help, helps to support research and um, the progress of our specialty as a whole. And each year we have a meeting, which is actually coming up next week for us, um, where we get to hear about the different research elements that are going on from around the community around the world. Trainees get the opportunity to also present to that meeting if they want to as well, but also a great opportunity to socialise and hear about what's going on in the, in the specialty as well in different aspects of it. And another point to mention as well is that we're, we're as a trainee group, um, we try and organise regular teaching sessions um, together each year, but also social events as well. So we've started organising um, the BNS NGS or Next Generation Socialising events, where we get together and talk about the different elements of training that we're up to at the moment. Um, if we're working in research, we can showcase that, but also just to get to know each other on a social level as well, which is really important in helping to support each other through training. 
So where are these training posts actually available? Well, these are just some of the locations that you'll find a training post um, in neuropathology. And so it will be a good idea if any one of these are of a particular interest is to get in touch with either the trainees at that department or the lead consultants there. Um, and they'll be happy to chat to you about opportunities in the future related to that as well. So in summary, um, I think it's a fantastic special to be involved with because you're very much involved with at the forefront of important diagnostic workup for patients. Um, and that may be through digital pathology, molecular pathology, and the forthcoming artificial use of artificial intelligence as well. It's a career that's filled with variety and diversity. So there are so many different elements to that, whether that's the different subspecialties that you'll be working in or the different techniques that you'll be involved with. There's a lot of variety to keep you interested um, and occupied and busy as well. You're very in, you have really integrated engagement with the clinical team and management. Um, so that's working very closely with the neurosurgeons, the neurologists and other clinicians in the hospital, as well as other colleagues in the histopathology department as well. Um, medical detective work is at the forefront of this, so bringing the jigsaw pieces together, and that's again common for neuro uh, pediatric pathology as well. And it, as I said, it's a fast-changing and developing specialty. So if you want to be part of a cutting-edge specialty, um, then definitely think about neuropathology. And there are extensive opportunities for engagement with teaching and research, if that's something that's particularly interesting, interesting for you as well. And I think a key message is you never stop learning. There are always many questions left to answer and there's a continuous educational opportunities throughout your career in neuropathology as well. And if you decide to join us, it would be fantastic to have you. And if it, just after the presentation, after, well, after the event as well, if anybody wants to get in touch and ask anything else, um, you can email me directly or you can also follow me on Twitter or, um, or X uh, if, you, um, if, you, if you want to message me that way as well. So thank you very much for listening and I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Jacinta who's going to talk to us about what a career in paediatric pathology can offer. So over to you Jacinta. Hi everyone and um, my name is Jacinta Murray. I'm a paediatric and perinatal pathology trainee at ST5 level in Glasgow. Hopefully you can all see my screen okay and all hear me okay. I came into paediatric and perinatal pathology from a slightly different avenue than, than Matt. I had worked clinically in obstetrics and gynecology for four years, had always liked pathology at university. And when I was thinking about other potential careers, I thought pathology, that's the one for me. So I applied, started, and it was actually after the sort of mandatory two week curriculum requirement of a placement in paediatric pathology that I did at Alderhey in Liverpool that I realised that this whole world of paediatric and perinatal pathology was such a lovely integration of the previous career I'd had in obstetrics and the potential career I could have in paediatric and perinatal pathology. I'll go on to elaborate on that a little bit more because it goes into a little bit about the perinatal pathology of paediatric and perinatal pathology, but it's just a brief overview of how I got here. So I'm going to outline what's attractive about paediatric and perinatal pathology, a kind of routine day or what a routine day could take for you if you chose this type of career, a brief outline of some of the developing areas in paediatric pathology and potential research opportunities, an overview of training as it stands, a little bit about the curriculum and a summary. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Um, I think for a lot of people, one of the most attractive things about paediatric pathology is the variety. So it's tertiary level work and it is subspecialization, but it still encompasses a lot of different specialty types. And I kind of wanted to try and illustrate that a little bit with this photograph. So I'm not sure if it's on the right or the left hand side of your screen, but this little box should have some products of conception up here. So this is a partial hydatiform mole. This picture here is a lung section from a child that has a congenital pulmonary airway malformation. This section here is a bone marrow infiltrated by acute leukemia. And this section here is a lymph node involved by Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And these are just some of the cases that I've reported with our consultant team over the course of the last month or two. So you really can see things like this in a single week, and there is a lot of variety in paediatric pathology. It's a rewarding career, and if you've looked at the paediatric and perinatal pathology section on the RC Path website, you might have seen that 
the um, Dr. Caroline Gannon, who's a retired paediatric and perinatal pathologist in Belfast, writes a lot about how she found that providing answers to families following perinatal and paediatric postmortems really gave her a great sense of contributing to society and allowing parents the opportunity to move on from their loss or inform their future pregnancies or to process what had happened in the death of the child. It has paediatric pathology and perinatal pathology have aspects of forensic pathology and neuropathology. So forensic pathology, particularly with the paediatric postmortems and neuropathology, a lot of the times we'll report our own um, brain sections from the perinatal postmortems with the babies that have died in utero and some of the stillbirths. So looking for things like hypoxic ischemic and cephalopathy. Similarly in neuropath, it's a small and friendly community. So it, it really is like a small group of clinicians that work at consultant level and a small group of trainees. So I think there's 12 to 15 trainees in the UK at the minute. And we do sort of all generally know each other or know where each of us is at in terms of their respective training. We work with really engaged clinicians. So paediatrics in general, I think, attracts people that really care about their patients, not that all clinicians don't, but you do feel that when you're working towards clinical pathological correlations with clinicians, they're really engaged in trying to help you get the best answer and providing you with the best information. There are training posts available, so I don't have this, the specifics so much, but in the last round of training, I think there were four posts and two of them were filled, so there were at least two. But if it was something you were considering and you were really interested, it would be worth getting in touch with your local paediatric pathology department and having a chat, expressing your interest so that they know that you're interested and they can look at what posts might be available in their area. It's a dedicated training program, so I'll go through a little bit more about what the structure of training is. But having a dedicated training program in paediatric and perinatal pathology actually it's quite different um, from other countries in Europe, from other countries in Australasia, Australia, New Zealand, and even America and how they structure the training. So the dedicated program means that you're, when you're finished, can work in perinatal and pediatric surgical pathology. And that means that you're a really attractive job prospect to places that are looking to recruit if you were interested in working overseas. The National organisations are the British and Irish Society of Paediatric and Perinatal Pathologists, and that's BRIPA. And then there's an international organisation that organised courses called IPA. And um, again, one of the attractive things about being a small group of people is that training and consultant posts in these organisations are generally a little bit more accessible. So. For instance, the College of Pathologists at present is going to have a vacancy in the trainee rep role for paediatric pathology. And as opposed to general histopathology, where there might be, I'm not sure how many there are in the UK, but possibly a thousand, let's say a thousand, applying for one or two posts. In paediatric pathology, because we're such a small group, your chances, your competition ratios, if you wanted to be involved in college roles or organisation roles, are a lot higher. The structure of training and the training programme directors are very supportive of less than full time training, out of programme training opportunities, whether that's research. And um, currently there's a medical education fellow who's doing some time working with Pathology Portal. As Matt had said about Neuropath, there's also some really great resources for paediatric pathology on the Pathology Portal that I'd wholeheartedly recommend. And ultimately, there's really good consultant job opportunities. So. And, and similar again to Neuropath, there are jobs in the northwest of England, there are jobs in um, Ireland, there's jobs in Birmingham, there's jobs in other departments. So there's just plenty of job opportunities around at consultant level. Every team day, it can vary. So it depends what your focus is as a consultant. So some jobs are both. Some jobs are paediatric and perinatal pathology. Some jobs focus on perinatal only. Some jobs focus on paediatric surgical pathology. The perinatal jobs and the perinatal component of training involves a mixture of the sort of things that I've outlined below. So autopsies, typically these happen in the mornings. 
And one of the things that I really enjoyed when I came into paediatric and perinatal pathology was getting to see cases that are only like described in textbooks. So things you would have learned about in medical school and struggled to conceptualize or struggle to retain when you're trying to study for like your paediatric exams at university. And if you see them, if you're trying to look at them in your hands and work out the connections in the heart and you're actually getting to see tetralogy of fallow and find out what that means, it's just really satisfying and you kind of understand it on a different level. And it also helps you understand better the embryology. So something like holoprosencephaly, and I had a case of this last week, it helps you understand the development of the brain and what happens when that goes wrong and what it results in. And um, the, like anything, if you do something, then you don't have to write it up. So if you look at something, you have to report it. So the part of the autopsies are the postmortem reports and the postmortem histology, including the neuropathology. Then placenta reporting forms an important part of our perinatal autopsy work, because often, even if the perinatal autopsy is normal, the placenta can give you an answer or contribute to the answer for why a baby died. We also look at placentas in cases of live babies where they've had complications such as intrauterine growth restriction. Multidisciplinary perinatal meetings are when we get together with the obstetricians and neonatologists and we do clinical pathological correlation and try and again do some of that stuff that Dr. Gannon was talking about, about <laughs> contributing and providing the information in the best way. Similarly, we work with genetics. So Basically, all perinatal autopsies in the UK will have a degree of genetic testing, the degree of which is dictated by the abnormalities you find. Genetic meetings really help us to expand on that initial round of genetic testing. So say you have a microarray that's normal, but a series of abnormalities. You can go to a genetics meeting and look at things like targeted exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing and things like that. Um, pediatrics. I talked about the massive variety and it really, it does like strike me every day how varied some of the things are. So we report in the training post I'm in, I report medical renals, medical liver, hematopathology specimens, tumours, bone and soft tissue, and the volume is really a little bit reduced compared to the other specialties, such as as a consultant in GI pathology, for instance, you might get a lot of negative GI specimens, partly because we have pediatric patients, the number of sort of routine investigations is a bit less. So partly I think you get an increase in complexity, but perhaps a slight reduction in volume. There are interesting MRI cases nearly every day, so it's never boring. And similarly to again what Matt was saying, like almost every week I'll find myself looking at a book like almost every day looking at a book, reading a research article, finding out something I don't know or something I've never seen before. And it just always keeps it really exciting and interesting. There are occasional frozen sections and um, a lot of the time in the context of Hirschsprung's disease and intraoperative biopsies. And it's a constantly evolving molecular landscape. So pediatric tumours in the UK now, um, well, in England particularly, have access to MGS sequencing. We more often use targeted testing to confirm mutations that we're suspicious of on the basis of morphology, but sometimes we will go on to do wider panels um, to try and investigate why, it, why a tumour has happened or try and find out what it is if we can't work it out on the basis of morphology. The paediatric hospital postmodernums and coronal fiscal work are another aspect of our work and again it partly relates to that overlap with forensic pathology and some of these cases are done as double doctor postmortems. So say a uh, sudden infant death syndrome with a history of overlay or suspicious circumstances, that would often be done as a double doctor postmortem. So if you do have an interest in forensics and postmortem work, paediatric pathology offers massive opportunities in that regard. And similarly to the, what it said about the engaged clinicians before, there's lots of interactions with different teams. So we do multidisciplinary meetings with renal physicians, with dermatologists, um, with the GI team, because it, it's really nice to work together and try and do these really like comprehensive clinical pathological correlations, ultimately to provide the best care for the patient. As regards research opportunities, so the... 
environment in paediatric pathology is one where there is lots of interest and ongoing work in molecular testing, as I kind of briefly talked about. So if you did have an interest in research on molecular pathology, um, I think the best way to approach it would be to look at who's publishing in that area, look at where they're working and see if there would be opportunities in that regard. Micro CT and MRI autopsy, if you had an interest in radiology, a lot of this um, research is done at GOSH and they do report um, and write a lot of research papers in this regard. There are numerous ongoing international oncology trials in paediatric pathology. So FAR-MS is a rhabdomyosarcoma trial that operates out of Manchester. FIT is a hepatoblastoma trial that operates out of Birmingham. And Umbrella is an international collaborative research study that um, involves nephroblastoma. There are lots of case report eligible cases. So again, going back to sort of how widely varied and interest and everything is, you do see a lot of really interesting stuff. And again, because it's a small community, they're comparatively compared to the competition ratios for presentations you're going to see in general histopathology. There are more opportunities to present at national meetings. So BREPA has a meeting. The Society of Pediatric Pathology is an American organization who meets twice a year. The PPS are the UK equivalent and they meet, I'm not sure if it's once or twice a year, but their last meeting was in Madrid. And the journal is Pediatric Developmental Pathology, which if you were interested in research and you wanted to read more about it, it might be a good place to start. So training overview, I think almost everyone here will already be in pathology. So just in case, um, the basics are you have to be qualified as a medical doctor, have GMC registration and have gone through the foundation program before you apply the histopath. Then you have integrated cellular pathology training. So that's general histopathology for a minimum of two and a half years. And after that, you can apply for pediatric and perinatal histopathology. It's not that rigid, so basically any time after you pass one part one, you could consider applying for paediatric pathology. If you've gone further than that and you're ST4, but you still think that maybe it might be for you, you could still do it. There's even potential for even after you've done the part two general, if you wanted to consider a career change into paediatric pathology, it wouldn't be ruled out. And some of my colleagues have come from jobs in the specialist register where they've qualified overseas and then they've come into paediatric perinatal pathology. So we're really open to lots of different routes in terms of getting into training. And then like everything else, there's always an exam and in PEDS, that's the FRC path PEDS. And it takes a similar format to the general histopathology exam, but doesn't have a specific cytology component. In training, you should do a mixture of paediatric surgical work, perinatal work, I'd say not so much cytology, and it might involve short attachments to other hospitals. Okay, so the curriculum, if you've signed up for this, you know where the RCPATH website is, so I'm, I'm sure you, you can have a closer look at the curriculum for specialty training in paediatric and perinatal pathology there. I've outlined the syllabus on the right, and it just talks about covering things in paediatric surgical pathology and perinatal pathology, and talks particularly about autopsy pathology. The numbers of work-based assessments are the same, essentially, as in general histopathology. And indicative numbers, we try and do 80 postmortems a year and 800 surgical cases. So postmortems really do form a really big part of our work. Okay, so just in summary, it's an exciting, diverse career um, with an interest in structured training program. There's lots of jobs opportunities um, all over the UK and generally, pardon me, in tertiary centres. And we're always happy to help. So as I said before, if you are thinking about a career in paediatric or perinatal pathology, it would be worth getting in touch with the department you'd be interested in working in. I certainly find that that was my experience, that once I got in touch with the department I was interested in, I instantly felt really welcome and it really encouraged me to apply. So I definitely would encourage you to do that. And if there's anything else that I can help with, please feel free to email me. Um, and that's everything. Thanks so much, Jacinta. That was a really nice overview of the specialty, and there's a lot of parallels between neuropathology as well. So thank you very much for taking the time to give us that talk. Um, noticing that some people are asking some questions in the Q&A, that's fantastic. Keep those coming in, um, and we can ask them in the session a little later on um, this evening as well. 
Um, but now we're going to move on to a session where we're going to explore a little bit um, more about what um, actually goes on in the day-to-day -day work of each specialty. And we've got a session about interesting and unusual cases. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fernanda Ruiz, who's going to give us the first one based around neuropathology. Over to you, Fernanda. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to present today this case. I'm, uh, I'm Fernanda. I'm a trainee in diagnostic neuropathology. I'm an ST4 level, and I'm based at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. And today I'm going to present a case that it's quite, well, it was quite unusual for us, but it also will help you to understand how we do the approach to the brain tumors and in this in, in the molecular area that, that Matt already told you about a little bit. So I'm going to show you how we uh, work up all these uh, the cases in the neuropathology department. So um, this particular case, um, it's a 50 year old lady with a past medical history of low back pain who presented with a collapse uh, that lasted less than a minute and it was admitted to the hospital on the images they found a frontal tumor and the tumor resection was really quite large actually it was almost five centimeter resection and in the same tumor resection they found the um, the bms person who was doing the the cut up of the of the of the sample found two different areas there was a calcified nodule and there were also some small subcortical where seem described gray nodules in the in the cortical um, uh, gray matter. So these are the low power view um, images of the, um, the samples from both areas of the same resection. So there was a large calcified uh, nodule and some small subcortical nodules. As you can see in this very low magnified um, image so if we go farther into a higher magnification you get to see in this calcified nodule um this area on the upper side of the of the of the image on, on your screen that there is infiltrated by two more as compared with this other area that's in between we have leptomeningeal surface in between and there are some leptomeningeal vessels as well and this is normal cortex um, which is populated with some neurons and uh, some glial cells. And this, in this other part of the, of the sample, there are obviously some tumor cells that are infiltrating that subtial regions. And if we take a look at these cells, this is a quite a monomorphic population of cells with rounded um, nuclei. And there are no, no mitosis, mitotic figures seen in this, in this uh, field. And these rounded nuclei, nuclei have, they have some um, clearing, perinuclear clearing around them. And there are some capillaries, very, very thin capillaries um, that are ramified within the lesion. The subcortical nodules look quite different. They are very well circumscribed from the uh, adjacent uh, white matter. As we can see here, this is a normal white matter. And the tumor, it's, um, mildly to moderately cellular the the background of the tumor is quite different to the to the one that we have seen before and if we see uh, the sample into a more high power view there are some different populations of the tumor cells there are small cells and there are also some larger cells as we can see here or here as well who has more cytoplasm and more ganglionic type of tumor cells and some of them are also binucleated like this one here and this one here as well. So they look more dysplastic neurons. So the approach to the, to, the, to the tumors, according to the WHO classification, the 2021 edition, it's in this molecular area. It's, it's not only looking into the histology, but also doing some immunostochemistry and molecular workup, just to try to understand and classify the tumor and also have some prognostic information and predictive information as well. So the first approach is doing uh, immunostochemistry, especially for IDH1 mutation and ATRX. In this particular case, the calcified nodule area showed IDH mutation, which is seen in the cytoplasmic staining, 
And opposite to the subcortical nodule where this tumor didn't show any IDH uh, mutation staining, and ATRX was retained in both. And there's some more other information. The synaptophysin immunostaining was positive in the subcortical nodule, especially in the ganglionic cells. Um, the, other, the, the other step that we do always for our uh, tumors, especially for gliomas, is the uh, methylation array, which can give you, um, which will classify the tumors into different subclasses according to the methylation status of the CPG um, islands of DNA of the tumor. So in both areas of the tumor, we found differences in the results of the, of the DNA methylation um, report. So this, the calcified nodule classified as, as we were expecting also after we saw the immunochemistry and the histology as an oligocentroglioma IDH mutant and 1P19Q codeletion, which is also seen in the copy number variation profile that it, the, it is the, that is the, derived from the methylation array. And here is 1P and 19Q chromosome codeletion. And the subcortical nodules classified as a diffuse glyceronal tumor, subtype A, this is a novel um, a class for the methylation class. So it's, it's, a, it's a type of tumor that is not uh, listed in the WHO uh, book of the uh, brain tumor classification. So it's a novel entity and has a very different methylation profile if we compare it with the oligocentroglioma. And it's very flat and there is no 1P90Q correlation. So there, are in once in the same resection, there are different tumors with different molecular alterations. And also the MGMT prediction, the methylation and the MGMT gene, uh, it's methylated in the classified nodule and is unmethylated in the subcortical nodules. We have also done um, DNA and RNA NGS next, next generation sequencing in both cases, in both areas of the tumor. And the DNA NGS proved what we have already seen in, in the previous test that, test, that there was an IDH mutation and the, that there was also a codeletion of 1P and 19Q, but they also, it also showed a third promoter mutation, which is a characteristic mutation in oligocentrogliomas. It is not prognostic it is not a prognostic um variant but it is a diagnostic tool important for the oligodendrogliomas but it didn't show any dna ngs and um, any variants were detected on the dna ngs um panel in the subcortical nodules but if in the rna ngs uh, panel it was found an entrac uh, gene fusion it was detected and this is um this kind of fusion was previously has been previously described in pediatric tumors, in pediatric glyneronal tumors, but it was never described in an adult case. And this is a targetable mutation, which is, could be important for the treatment. So um, in summary, all the molecular and histological alterations that we found in this case are the follow. And this is the way we do the integrated diagnosis in neuropathology for brain tumors. So we have found that the, in the histology, one of the areas was an oligotendroglioma IDH mutant, low grade, so it's a grade two, and the other area was a low grade glyoneronal tumor. Then we have the methylation profile, which classified this tumor these tumors into two different entities. One is an oligodendroglioma IDH mutant and one P90Q catalytic, and the other area was a diffuse glyonormal tumor subtype E, which is a novel um, methylation class. The next generation sequencing, uh, the DNA one um, found this variant that we already have seen and the third promoter mutation, and the RNA found the NTRAC uh, gene fusion for the glyonormal tumor. And the MGMT um, prediction by the Illumina array was methylated for one of the, the areas and unmethylated for the other. So the final integrated diagnosis, and this is what we do in our uh, daily basis practice for brain tumors um, workup, it's uh, for the calcified nodule and oligodendroglioma IDH mutant and 1P19Q catalytic CNSWHO grade 2. And for the subcortical nodules, 
nodules. It was a low grade glenerol tumor, which is not graded because it's a new entity. So there, we don't know exactly how it is going to behave. So finally, um, the patient um, postoperatively had a mild facial, facial weakness and she received uh, radiotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy as per the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence Guidelines for glioma treatment. And this is a very interesting case because the publications from the premolecular area of the CNS tumor um, described cases of oligosome glioma with glioma like maturation. And this is described, but they have found 1p19 q deletion in both areas of the tumors. But in this particular case, the 1p19 q deletion was not found in both, in both areas. And also, it was described oligosome gliomas associated with pleomorphic centrosocytomas and gangliocytomas, but not with ganglionar tumors. And well, this is a dual glioma. The prognostic implications of this type of tumor remains an area of active investigation. And I think we need to uh, monitor in these patients and uh, to see the, the nature and, uh, and redefine the prognostic indicators of these particular tumors. Thank you very much. So if you have any other questions, you can send me an email. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Fernanda. A fascinating case um, and really highlights, really, I think, uh, well, the importance of molecular to try and differentiate those two tumours, but also from the very beginning about how important the macroscopic assessment of the tissue is to actually identify those two abnormalities. Um, if you've got any questions uh, to ask Fernanda about that case or the techniques that were used to actually get to the diagnosis for that, um, then please pop them in the Q&A um, Q box at the bottom and we can ask them in the um, following session. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, um, next little bit, we were going to talk to you a little bit about um, what to do next. And myself and Jacinta have um, sort of covered a lot about this in our um, in our talks already, but just as a, a quick uh, run through about what you can do next if you're wanting to pursue either of these specialties is just get in touch. You've had several emails get on, come on the screen tonight um, and just email us and we can certainly help and guide you and point you in the right direction. I think visiting a department if you haven't already done so to, for a placement would be a really good idea. Get yourself immersed in the specialties and see what the day to day running of it is like. Visit the college website as well. That will provide you a bit more information about the different specialties um, and, again, the day-to-day -day running and what they consist of. But also you can see the curricula um, and the training, um, what that consists of as well, um, and about the assessments and the exams. And speak more with existing trainees. We're all a friendly bunch, very happy to talk to anybody that's interested in pursuing the specialties in the future. Um, and look out for vacant posts as well. So again, having conversations with the trainees will really help you um, to find out where these posts may be and whether they might be ones that you're thinking would, would consider applying for. Um, anything from your point of view, Jacinta, to add to that? No, I think just the same. And one of the things you had covered in your talk was saying that the applications are open in autumn and spring, and just to say it's the same for paediatric pathology. Um, so it should be coming up in the next few months for posts that would be open in August and yeah just to have a look there and keep an eye on Oriel and that should sort of give you a, a rough time scale and also that we want you please come and apply and if you do have any other questions about the interview process or competitions or anything like that then please get in touch because then um, yeah we're all very happy to help and we'd love to have you. Excellent thanks so much Jacinta. And we're now going to move on to our Q&A session. So if I could ask us, all our panellists to switch their cameras on, that'd be fantastic. And we've got lots of questions come through already. Um, but I'm actually going to start with one. Um, we're lucky to have George with us tonight, who's George has very recently undergone the interview and application process and joining neuropathology next month, actually. George, do you have any sort of top tips about how someone should approach sort of this application window or application period um, and how to be successful with it? Um, I think... You know, the interviews I thought were, were, you know, quite tough, but I think what they really wanted to see was like a commitment to the specialty. So, but you really understand what the day to day, in my case, neuropathology, what the day to day job of a neuropathologist is. So, like you said, Matt, I think extending that minimum of two weeks to a six week period in the first two and a half years of neuro, which is what I did, I maxed out on that. And I'd done a taste a week as an F2 in neuropathology. So, I think I had a good grasp of what the day-to-day -day job is and the different sort of facets of a specialty. So I think really understanding what the job's going to involve is probably the most important thing that 
the panelists want, wanted to see. That was my impression anyway. Brilliant. Thanks, George. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a message we've all sort of communicated tonight across both specialties. So that's really useful advice. Thank you. So now coming on to the questions that we've asked, we've had one about the chat exam as part of neuropathology training. Fernanda, can you give us a little bit of background about do we need to do the chat exam in neuropathology? Um, well, the chat exam, it's it's a different exam that is not part of the neuropathology training, but the uh, postmortem examination, it is part of the part two examination of neuropathology. So it's quite um, it's quite similar, but it's not the same exam. So nowadays, for the part two examination in neuropathology, a postmortem, a general postmortem examination, it's needed for uh, it's it's one of the of the main if one of the the parts of the part two examination. So the trainee is affected to eviscerate the body and to do the the section of the organs and to approach to the the cause of death. In a general case, it's not just a neuropathology pathological case so it's general pathology and it's part of the part two examination of, of neuropathology but it's a different exam it's not the chat exam itself it's a different one yeah it's actually part of our our actual the whole part of our exam isn't it and same for pediatric pathology as well so you don't need to do that separately thanks for the question that's great and thanks for the answer fernanda um I've got one, well, George, thank you for your questions and comments about this, about trainees actually engaging with the specialties actually at an early stage. Perhaps I'll come to Monica and Claire about that. Um, what's your views on this at the moment and what the sort of standard expectation really um, for when trainees should perhaps consider joining, um, join, well, coming and visiting these specialties? Claire, you've got your hand up. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to try and debunk the, the, the myths that float around about this. Um, so actually, in the 2021 curriculum, trainees are expected to get neuropathology and paediatric pathology exposure in ST1 and ST2. Ideally, we would like people to have, you know, six weeks worth of experience um, in many centres because of the way rotations are set up for general trainees. They might get two or three weeks. But that's not to say that if you're interested, you can't go and ask your lead educational supervisor or your TPD for more. So it, it's it's built into the curriculum that you should have that exposure before you sit the part one exam. Um, the other thing that in the questions about when to apply, another myth as, as well is um, people feel that they have to apply in ST2. It has to be done then and it has to be, you know, there and then. You, you can apply any time, um, really, from doing part one onwards. So um, one person has asked, could you apply when you haven't done the part one yet, but you're about to sit it? Now, for, for paediatric pathology, we're certainly keeping offers open post-interview um, to be released after the exam results come out. So if you're in that situation where you really can't wait and you want to get going, you can do the part one, apply, um, and if you've passed, you, you can go straight into an ST3 post. Having said that, you can leave it later as well, post part one, you can be an ST4, you could even be an ST5 if you wanted to. Thanks very much, Claire. That's very helpful. Yeah, I applied when I was in ST3, actually. So again, it's, it's, it's yeah. when, when it's convenient for you, hopefully. Heather, you've got your hand up. Hand up. Yeah, just kind of a, a comment on, on that anecdotally. Um, and I think Jacinta men men uh, mentioned this as well. I didn't hadn't wasn't considering going into paediatric pathology until I'd done the compulsory two week placement. As I say, I think just to mention the same. So I think that just highlights actually re the significance of trying to get that experience as early as possible to to get that exposure, which you really don't get anywhere else, and um, getting it quite early so you you can get a real grasp and understanding of, of what the special subspecialties can can offer. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. And would you echo the same thing, Monica, from the neuropath side? I think you're on mute, I think, Monica. Yeah, I pressed it twice. Sorry, <laughs> yes. no, I wanted to say again, yes, you can uh, apply when you haven't got the FRC path part uh, one exam back yet. But we do look that by the start date, you would have completed the 2.5 years of histopathology training. So all I would say is that look at the person specification uh, when the jobs are released and follow that. And if you're not sure, email one of us or email the college and they will direct you to it. So we do have to stick by the criteria, but, but that's that's essentially it. Uh, but we try to be as flexible as we can within those criteria. In terms of moving into the specialty, I know we're all very keen, or I remember in my days, 
everybody wants to get on with their training and finish and so on and so forth. But I think it would be a shame if there was somebody here who maybe is very interested in neuropathology and maybe it's an ST4, even an ST5, you know, do not rule it out because yes, we're in a certain stage, but if you just move forward, fast forward, yes, you've done maybe an extra two years and you don't want to de delay further, but we are preparing for a long career, you know, if retirement becomes later and later. And when you're, let's say in your mid fifties or forties or whenever, you know, those two years seem nothing. So it's good to think about these things and be open. And, and it, 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 it's not wasted time because you will bring extra experience. And we have colleagues who trained in general histopathology because we, they trained in different countries because neuropathology isn't a special, a separate specialty in, other, in, in most other countries actually. And they come here and, and do neuropathology and they bring something extra because they have got that histopathology training. It's about diversity. That's the other thing. There was a question here, or can you only do neuropathology if you have a PhD? And I'm really sad, or somebody was told this. I'm sad to hear that because I have a colleague who is a very successful uh, consultant neuropathologist, training program director, very in, heavily involved with training herself, who was told when she wanted to enter neuropathology training, she shouldn't bother because she didn't have a PhD. And I'm very, it's, yeah, I'm sad to see that that's still the case. It's about diversity. It's great that we have colleagues who have PhDs, who then do PhDs while they're training. And those who don't have a PhD, whatever the reasons might be, you know, um, it's diverse. We are a small group. And so it's important to have diverse backgrounds. That's all I would say. Does I that def help? definitely echo that, Monica. Yeah. I think there's so much mm -hmm. flexibility in our both our specialties. Um, so there is no pressure that you have to do research or anything like that. If you want to and you're interested, then you'll be supported to do that. But that doesn't mean you you don't have to if you don't want to. So I definitely echo what you've said there. And again, yeah. the importance of, as you say, going through training, you've got to be in work in what you enjoy and be happy in what you enjoy. And that's a priority. So at whatever stage of life that may be that you find that, um, you should just keep pursuing that and pursuing that interest and you'll be supported to do that as well. Um, so we'll move on to another question. Um, so there was a question about, are there opportunities to train in your specialties for scientists? Uh, Raluca, I'll come to you. What, what about within, within your specialty about this? Well, in pediatric pathology, basically pathologists are histopathologists, so there is no route of entry from a separate uh, specialty. So I know that in neuropathology, I think you can enter from clinical training, like from neurology. There isn't that option to actually be a histopathologist, a pediatric histopathologist from a scientist perspective. Um, the things that could potentially apply to PMSs would be things like placental trimming. So for example, in our department, two or three placental trims per week are being done by PMSs and the, those are done unsupervised. So you can uh, of course, advanced on that route and gain more experience and become more proficient on that respect. There isn't reporting. So scientist reporting is not done uh, by anyone else other than histopathologists in pediatric and perinatal pathology. So it's not like I know that other specialties can have small routine specimens being reported by BMSs. That's not something that happens in pediatric pathology. And I think it's a bit it would be difficult to introduce just because we have such a huge variety of uh, of specimens that wouldn't be um, wouldn't wouldn't fit with that type of reporting. Thanks, Relika. I'm uh, just conscious of time, but we've got a few hands up. So, if just quickly, Monica, what do you think? What's your view? Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, uh, it was mentioned that you can enter like, histopathology from neurology directly. That's no longer the case. That was an experiment of the mm -hmm. 2012 curriculum that has stopped. You have to enter from histopathology, so the integrated cellular pathology training stem, just to make that clear. There is no BMS reporting in neuropathology. The complexity is such that, uh, that it's not something that has been supported. It has been discussed at SSC level, but it's not supported. Um, if you are a scientist and want to get involved via brain banks, so more in the research setting we have some neuroscientists who have started maybe doing cutting some brains in the research setting and doing some basic staging but that's usually over uh, their supervision from a uh, trained consultant medically qualified neuropathologist thanks monica mm -hmm. uh, claire there has been chat on the clin on the scientist side for enhancing roles of biomedical scientists um, in placental reporting, and that is something that is currently um, under discussion with the pediatric SAC at the college, um, looking at, at formats for this. 
So um, it's not in, it's not open yet, but it's something in the plan. But Reluca is quite right. There's quite widespread um, BMS trimming of placentas, so a lot more macro dissection by BMS staff, but not the reporting yet. We haven't got the infrastructure in place yet, basically. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. And Will? Um, I was just going to say exactly what Claire has just said. Fantastic. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to come to Tom next. Um, we've got a question, Tom, about co the, how complex both specialties are becoming in, in, with the integration of molecular pathology into practice. Um, is there a tendency to join neuropathology or paediatric pathology after gaining research experience? And would that improve the possibilities of getting into training? What's your view about that? Um, yeah, I think that's that's really interesting in terms of how much molecular pathology is, is coming in, especially to the neuro-oncology uh, part of our workload. Um, I think you, it's, it's kind of a similar question to that which was asked before, is, is, re is research essential? I think it's not essential, but it should be seen as a real opportunity to, to pursue in, in our speciality. Um, you don't have to do it, but there are plenty of opportunities too, and I think it particularly with the molecular work in neuro-oncology, if your research is, is uh, in that same field, it, it, it um, integrates really very nicely. And so I think um, it should be seen as an opportunity rather than an than a obligation, um, and also that it yeah, merges very well with the, with the clinical work. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and no, I can speak from my own experience that it's really, I found it I found it really interesting after being someone who was actually quite frightened of molecular and genetics to begin with, but now really got immersed in it and really enjoy it. And it's really helped with my training as well. Um, so yeah, if you want to take those opportunities, they're there if you wish them as well. Fantastic. Um, Fernando, there's a question about the molecular tests that you were talking about in your talk. Um, is that, are these available in all neuropath centers? And is, it, is methylation profiling now part of the diagnostic workup for brain tumors? Um, well, methylation profiling is part of the workup for most of the, of the of brain tumors. For I mean, probably we have to say that molecular tests are part of the workup for for all the brain tumors nowadays. But we do methylation in a in, in several of them. But we can do also just PCR in some of the tumors, especially if we see just say glioblastomas, for example. We don't do methylation for um, on on a routine basis uh, basis. But um, molecular tests are, are an important part of the of the routine, and they are methylation profiling. Actually, is not available in, in all the centers, and especially uh, there are some large centers in London where um, some um, they receive referral cases from different parts of the UK, and so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a work that is done between different centers and it's it's um it's not available in, in all of them but i'm not sure about other centers we know that i know that in london we, re we receive uh, samples from different centers uh but i think they are available in, in other as in other as well in other hospitals Thanks, Fernanda. Yeah, there's the quite a well established referral pathways, aren't there? For if you would like molecular tests done on your on your tumor, um, then you can request that, and they can be sent to the centre. And yeah, as you say in London, we're we're quite a referral centre for quite a number of different places. Um, but yeah, the, there is an opportunity for those to be done. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I was going to go down to this. There's um, a question about. Uh, do neuropathologists do full general full body PM only if there is a suspected neurological or neuromuscular cause of death? Um, so, Monica, what's the situation with that? Yes, so we are currently all trained, as we've said. It's not the CHAT exam, but it's equivalent, so we can do full autopsies. But many of us wouldn't do enough of these. So what many centers do, and that's my personal practice, is if there is a postmortem, which is a neuro question, but it also matters uh, to know what the systemic uh, situation is, so the systemic organs. I do a so-called combined neurogeneral postmortems. So I will liaise with the general autopsy pathologist on the rotor here in Oxford. They will do the general. I will do the neuro bit, so the brain retrieval. And we may have a chat together. We'll do it together, and uh, then we, you know, I may decide: do we need to retain the brain? Do and so on. But I don't perform general autopsies uh, any longer 
uh, simply because there aren't the numbers for me to keep my skills up to date. And also we've discussed there's a shortage of neuropathologists. There's so much work for us to do. So it's increasingly many centers felt that our expertise is employed more towards the neuro and no longer routine general autopsy work. And this is a current active area of discussion also maybe for the next update to the curriculum. There's work going on in the background as we speak to think what our specialty needs in terms of training. Should it be optional or should it continue to be mandatory? But any change will take time. We know this with GMC, you know, we're talking more years rather than months for any change to, to take effect. Does that answer that question? Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. And um, we've also had a question from Matt Wilson. Thanks, Matt. Um, is there any benefit at interview or as a trainee of having worked in paediatrics or neurology clinically? Heather, what do you think about that? Is there a benefit to that um, from paediatric side? So I think um, it certainly wouldn't do any harm in that having a, a wider understanding of, of other specialties can help, but it certainly it's not a necessity and I don't think you'd necessarily be at a disadvantage if you haven't done that equally. I know personally I hadn't. Um, so, and I think it'd be similar for neuropath. The paediatric pathology is very integrated. There's a lot of um, different of clinical integration as well with the CPCs. So having that uh, background would be helpful with the specialty, but with regards to the interview process itself, um, I, as I say, I, I don't think it would be a, a detriment to you if you haven't got that. So I, I certainly wouldn't worry if that isn't the background that you've got. I don't think you'll be disadvantaged by that. Thanks very much, Heather. Thank you. I'm going to come on to a question about general pathology training. So postponing it, um, subspecialty training to a later stage, is it helpful for specialty training? I'm going to ask Raluca first, but then perhaps come to George as, as someone who's actually undergoing histopathology training, done the first two years at the moment, whether you found it beneficial as well, George. So perhaps Raluca first, and then George with your reflections about it as well. So just building up on what's already been said, and I'll, I'm going to try to be brief because I'm aware of the time. Uh, my route of entry into pediatric pathology is actually quite atypical. So I finished histopathology training in general pathology overseas. I've worked briefly here as an academic clinical fellow and as a consultant, and then decided to specialize in pediatric and perinatal pathology. So coming in with a little more experience in general pathology than the normal route at ST2, ST3, I feel that this was particularly helpful for me, uh, especially in a field such as pediatric and perinatal pathology, which is quite varied. So you get to see all the systems, you get to see things new every time. And it's, I feel that at least for me, it was very helpful to develop those skills of reading the slide and getting instincts and maybe pulling out on, th on things that I've seen rarely or briefly in my training otherwise. So you wouldn't get the repetitive things like the colorectal cancers or staging of breast cancers, things that in general pathology are quite routine and very repetitive, but you do get exposed to a lot of specimens and having a general pathology perspective is actually, I think, quite helpful, particularly in pediatric and perinatal pathology. That's lovely. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, George, what are your thoughts? Um, so obviously I'm going to come into neuropathology having done the minimum amount of training required which would be two and a half years but that is still six months more than it used to be so I guess an extra 25 percent longer um so whilst I wouldn't be maybe quite as good as someone who'd maybe CCT'd in histopathology I still think well hopefully I'll have be, you know be good enough to be able to recognize you know mainly like metastases to the brain and that type of thing um and I suppose on the other hand you know by not having got as far I'm maybe like possibly a bit younger in my career so I've kind of like you know I'm still interested in lots of different things so you know I'm still interested in doing post-mortems and that type of thing so I guess there's pros and cons but you know hopefully it's okay <laughs> thanks George uh, Jacinta Hi, Matt. just really briefly um I think whatever your background is whether it's clinical whether you've done peds or neurology before that will bring something whether you've done histopath before that'll bring something or whether you're just really enthusiastic and you've done two and a half years and you're going to get into it like that'll bring something so I think if you're already here you're already showing an interest so just keep going and like there's there's opportunities for everyone there's not like one way to get through it. <laughs> Thanks, Jacinta. I think, yeah, my message, I've taken quite a long time through training, but I've made the most of opportunities along the way. And I think we're always maybe too quick to want to get to the end. But just my advice is just make the most and diversify as you go along. 
Um, I'm conscious of time. We're going to have one more question um, and then we'll draw an end to the, the event. Um, is there any additional molecular pathology training relevant to the subspecialty integrated into either of the subspecialty training programs? Will, do you have any thoughts about that from the molecular side? Um, not as far as I know at the moment. Um, it would certainly be beneficial to have some time in molecular pathology if you can. I think the nature of pediatric pathology and neuropathology is such that we do so much molecular, it's an everyday thing, that you become very, very good at it. Um, and so a bit more experience might be helpful. And you could certainly ask for a week to go to a molecular pathology lab to find out what goes on. Um, but in terms of specific time, probably not necessary. Thanks, Will. And I think from the neuropath side, it was very similar. I think it's such an integrated part of our work now um, that your training is part of your day job. So it's not unusual for every day for you to come across some molecular components in different capacities as well. So um, I think it's it's part of uh, the integrated program. So you don't necessarily need to have a few weeks placement um, elsewhere in it. Thank you very much to the panel for being part of the Q&A session and thank you so much to the audience for all those questions. Any ones that I think we have managed to address most of the ones that were submitted. If any ones we haven't done, we'll make sure that written answers are available and perhaps put a Q&A um, quest frequently asked questions section up on the website of the college for you to, to access as well. Um, but it just remains for me to say thank you so much to you all for joining. Thank you. A huge thanks to all the panellists for taking the time out of their evenings to be here tonight and for all the presenters as well. Um, it's been a fantastic event. Um, I really enjoyed being part of it. Um, and thank you very much. Hopefully you'll all now think about um, one of these specialties for the future. And as we've said, if you'd like to get in touch with any of us, um, please do so. And we're happy to chat or meet on Teams or Zoom or come and join us in the department um, to discuss the options further. Um, Claire, you've got your hand up. Just one very final cheeky comment. Um, the next recruitment round for PEDS it will open on July the 21st. So I don't know if Monica's got the date for neuropathology, but it'll be a, a similar time frame. So they're if all aligned, to... Claire. It's national. They're all aligned the dates. Yep. We can't choose them. So thank you for confirming the date. Yeah, it is in July, but I hadn't quite worked ahead that much because we are just in the middle of a recruitment round. So we're kind of busy with that. Yeah. Uh, but the next one would be the same as yours. Yeah. Very good. Thanks, yeah. Claire. Thanks, Monica. So, yeah, keep an eye on the next rounds and, yeah, do get in touch if we can help. But thank you all very much for being a part of the event tonight and hopefully see you soon. Thank you.